with this lecture we are going to look at the, a very important uh, side of the inter interrelationship between the internet and society. And it's the juridical side, the legal side. Okay? Up, to, up to now you have uh, listened to professors to, that address different points of view, or journalists, writers that just look at the other. You also really, uh, listen to a law professor like Brad Fishman, but a very particular, peculiar law professor, also because of the topics that he chose, like the professor uh, knowledge commons uh, and uh, how to be to detect uh, uh, the humanization of, of people. So he didn't address specifically legal issues, but uh, eventually now is the time to, to listen to a law professor, now it's Professor Maurizio Borghi. Uh, is Italian, as the name suggests, but has been teaching now in the United Kingdom for several years and uh, recently has moved, uh, about a year, two years ago, has moved to Berlin the University and where he has a research group focusing mostly on intellectual property and maybe more specifically on copyright and uh, is looking at the, at the issues of internet regulation um, uh, with a specific interest for the European level, which is, of course for us it's uh, a very important level of, uh, of regulation. Uh, therefore, uh, he's introducing an important uh, uh, understanding and point of view if we want to understand, uh, at least attempt to understand the internet and society issues. Therefore, I'm particularly pleased to welcome him and thank him for us having accepted our invitation. Thank you. Is a, is a copyright counsel at Google, 
And he was telling us that uh, when he was appointed at Google in 2006, uh, there was a long discussion in Google on whether uh, do we really need a copyright lawyer uh, at all, uh, not, not to, 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 to say so someone who is actually gaining uh, quite a decent salary. So it's, it's really worth investing money in appointing a copyright lawyer. Why do we need a copyright lawyer? That was 2006. Uh, today, the the legal office of Google has a, a, a whole department on copyright. Why a company like Google, who is not a content provider, Google does not produce copyright content at all. Does not produce news, does not produce uh, films, music, nothing. Why a company like Google has such a strong interest in, in copyright? This is uh, what I uh, suggest is an uh, um, uh, in-depth, subtle effect of copyright on the very technical functioning of, of the internet. So copyright does not affect only the content, only the, the videos that we watch on YouTube, the music that we uh, share on peer-to-peer -peer platform. It's not only about this, but most importantly, it's about the very functioning of of uh, the internet. Uh, so I, I will do like this. I will start with some basic copyright. I, I, I will not say copyright for dummies because it is not the right, uh, not the polite way to, to, to address. But just a few few elements of copyright law to, to understand what I want to, to address, uh, and then. I will look more specifically at two uh, cases. One is the case of hyperlinking, and the other one is the case of uh, uh, crawling, web crawling. <coughs> crawling is the automatic uh, searching and indexing pages on, on the web. How many of you have a background in information technology? Okay, too many to, for me to say. If I'm saying something stupid, just a raise your hand. Correct. So, and, and in any case, just feel free to interrupt me if you want to, uh, to explain something or if you want to address the question. Um, I mean, copyright is a, is a large topic, but in essence, uh, we can summarize copyright into two main principles. One is that copyright is about the right to copy, and this is the word copy itself. Copyright itself. The right to authorize or prohibit copying. And the second element is that a copyright is about disseminating uh, those copies to the public. So we have, on the one hand, we have the notion of copying. And the question is why? Why is copying a wrong in, in general? And more specifically, what is copying? What is a copy? Um, we will see in a bit. I would say that there is something, when, when we say copying, there is a, uh, something intuitive that, uh, for instance, if uh, a friend of mine uh, borrows me a paper, uh, and I publish this paper in my, in my name, I do something wrong, so this is quite intuitive. But why, if I take a, a published paper, the same paper once is published, and I multiply these copies, I make photocopies and I distribute these copies to my friend, why is this, again, an infringement? This is not so clear. One might say, well, the, public, the, the, the paper was already published, if you publish a paper, it's because you want it to disseminate to the public. What's wrong with copying? What's wrong with multiplying copies? And the same with, uh, with music, with films, with any creative content. So, despite the fact that there is a sort of intuitive basis, it's not clear why copying in general should be uh, not permitted. And the second thing is uh, the notion of the public. Copyright has to do with the acts that are addressed to the public. As a, a 
Goldstein, who is a famous copyright scholar, said, copyright is a law of public places and commercial interests. This is a very American way of addressing the essence of copyright. Public places, copying in private is not a problem. Copying in public is what copyright is about. And commercial interests. Now, what's wrong with copying? If, if copying is related to uh, disseminating the work to the public and uh, copyright is uh, about uh, giving some control over this uh, dissemination uh, to the public, is copying without public dissemination an, an, an infringement? So if I make copies but I do not uh, distribute these copies to the public, am I infringing? Why? Maybe, in principle, no. In principle, there is nothing wrong. But, at least historically, uh, copying is, so to speak, the best predictor of an intention to infringe. If someone uh, makes a uh, hundred of copies of a book in his garage, even before disseminating these this, uh, this copies to the public. One might say, why do you make all these copies? Is there any other reason uh, but uh, to, to infringe? So, historically there was no other reason to make copies than to infringe. Now, the point I want to, to, to address now with this long introduction is that this is perhaps no longer the case today with the internet and with the digital technology where copying is part of the everyday use of the digital technology. So, um, historically there are uh, the, the, the issue of whether certain activities are copying or not have been addressed other times before the internet. Uh, for example, in, at the end of the, of the 19th century uh, where uh, the first uh, machines for mechanical reproduction of sound were invented and one of, the, uh, of these machines, which was quite popular, was the pianola. Essentially, uh, the, the, the pianola was an automatic piano where you enter a perforated roll and this machine played music. The copyright holder said, well, this is an infringement because you are reproducing my my sheet music and uh, court, courts consistently refuse to see this as a copy because they say a copy is something that is addressed to human eyes a copy is something that a human can read uh, something that only a machine can perform this is not a copy for, for copyright purposes <coughs> So, at, at, um, at some point, the, the law had to change and to include mechanical reproduction in, in uh, nowadays it's called sound recording uh, among the restricted acts in copyright. But there, is, there, there was nothing in, uh, in, uh, in principle in copyright law that prevented this, uh, this form. So, the, the law had to, to change, to adapt to, to technology. And uh, the other case, which is more close to today, is uh, computer programs. Uh, as you perhaps know, because when you install a computer, uh, a software, for instance, in Microsoft, Microsoft Office, you see the, the C copyright um, of Microsoft, which means that computer program is copyright protected in the same way as a novel is protected, a piece of music, now, before the law changed to adapt and to include copyright, uh, computer programs among the, the protected subject matter of copyright, uh, courts, again, were uncertain as to whether these things are protected by copyright or not, are copies or not. And again, the argument is, was that 
a series of 1 and 0, which is uh, the uh, uh, object code of a computer program, is not a copy because it's not something that a human can read, only a machine can, can, can read. <coughs> Afterwards, the law changed, and now, now nowadays, object uh, code is a, 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 a copyright subject matter, so it, it is protected by copyright. So, this excursion is to, 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 to say that uh, the notion of copy uh, is a, a historical one. It changes over time, and it takes different meanings uh, in relation to different technologies. Something similar happened to the other key notion of, co of copyright, the public. So, again, we said copyright is about two main notions, copy and public. Public, until uh, one century ago, was mainly uh, addressed with respect to public performance. Public performance is, for instance, the uh, the thing that is happening now, I am speaking to you, this is a public performance. But what is the, the, the characteristic of this act of speech? Is the fact that we are simultaneously in the same time at the same place. Now, in broadcasting, uh, things change in the sense that uh, the public was uh, simultaneously there, but only in the time sense, not in the space sense. So uh, the public was scattered all over the all over uh, the country, but was receiving the the work at the same time. Now with the internet, another uh, shift occurred, whereby not only the public is not there uh, in the same place, but not even at the same time. So when a content is uploaded. On a, on a website, uh, I can access it now from here. Another one can access the same content uh, from the other part of the world in five minutes from now, another one in uh, one hour from now, and so on. So, <clears throat> the public is uh, scattered both in terms of space and in time. So, the notion of public changes. And in the uh, example we will uh, give uh, in a bit, we see that what constitutes a public and what is not a public, what is a private circle, is quite difficult to determine in, in certain uh, situation. In case of public performances, we can see that it's pretty much an, uh, an issue of number. If uh, someone is uh, performing a song before an audience like you right now, this is likely to be a public performance because you are a large audience. But if someone performs a song before uh, his friends or relatives, this is likely to be a private audience. But what happened on the internet? Where the notion they were, where, where, where the public is not is no longer a matter of numbers. So the the private public divide has become so uncertain in the on the internet that the, uh, a copyright scholar Jane Ginsburg in 1995 said that the entire concept of private copying, private copying is traditionally um, um, a permitted activity under copyright law. The entire concept of private copying makes little sense in a world where the work is predominantly marketed directly to end users. Everyone is a private, but the, 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 the sum of all these private person is, it can, might well be a public. And the market for normal or normal exploitation of the work will by and large be the private copying market. So, how
how did the internet change uh, the, the, the picture? The so-called digital copyright is, uh, in a way, the extension of the traditional concept of copyright to, uh, to the internet. So, copying and the public have been translated to, to, to the internet. There are some problems because uh, copying has a different meaning on the internet. The public, as we said right now, uh, has, uh, is, is different. But the idea was to translate these concepts into, into, into the internet and to give authors exclusive rights over control, to control the communication uh, of their words to the, to the internet. So, reproduction of the work is, uh, uh, covers both permanent and temporary reproduction. Temporary reproduction is, for example, the reproduction that um, um, occurs in the RAM memory of a computer, which is only volatile and, and uh, uh, temporary. This is still copied under the definition of the law. However, certain uh, acts <coughs> that are purely dictated by technology are not infringing. For example, as you know, every uh, time you open a web page on the on the on the internet, you open, when you browse the internet, you make temporary copies on your computer, on the screen of your, of your computer, on the on the memory of your computer. So these copies are not infringing. However, determining the dividing line between an infringing copy and non-infringing copy is, is uh, um, controversial and complicated. But we are not entering into, into this discussion now. <coughs> I want to address the, the, the issue of uh, so-called copy-reliant technologies. So, what, what happens with the, with the internet is that while before the internet, copying was mainly was a, was a, a, an activity that was mainly, if not exclusively, uh, oriented to infringement, to public communication. On the internet, this is no longer the case. And copy-reliant technologies are technologies that use copying in a technical way. So they, they, they do not copy in order to disseminate the content, but they copy for purely technical uh, purposes. And uh, a search engine is, is, a, is a, the most obvious example. Okay, the, the a search engine like Google's, in order to work, must make copies of all the web pages and of the web. And these copies, again, they are not meant to uh, distribute, disseminate the content. They are only meant to enable indexing and search. <coughs> and uh, uh, who knows what, what, what text mining is? Text mining? Can you explain what text mining is? Uh, a specific factor inside the, the, the value of text. Yes, is is a uh, is an oh, correct me if I'm wrong. Is the automated uh, analysis of uh, large amounts of text, typically abstracts of scientific papers, in order to identify patterns. For example, uh, text mining might find that there is a certain uh, recurrency between a disease and the gene, which is not, has not been made explicit in the literature, but is implied by the fact that these two terms uh, appear frequently in, in connection one to, to the other. So, text mining is, is, a, is a, 
in the software analysis of large amount of text to, to discover unpredicted patterns or uh, uh, knowledge. And uh, uh, iParadigm, who, who knows who, what iParadigm is? iParadigm is uh, the company that uh, owns Turnitin. You know Turnitin? Turnitin is the software to detect plagiarism. This is very popular in the UK and, and in America. I don't know if at Polytechnic or in Torino. It's huge. Uh, so uh, students have to submit their papers to Turnitin to assess plagiarism, to see whether uh, the, the essay has been copied from the internet and from, from other sources or it is original. Again, this is just an example of a technology that has to engage into mass copying to uh, produce a technical result. It's not the same copying as uh, copying for disseminating the content or infringing copyright. However, copyright was designed to prevent copying. So how does copyright deal with this, uh, with this situation? Well, there is not an intent to, uh, to exploit um, the work. But there is just a... Uh, Copying is just a technical means to achieve a purpose which is not related to a dissemination of content. So, uh, since we have to address the legal, you know, the legal issues of the, of the internet, one might wonder how, in how many ways can I breach the law when I, when I, when I use the internet? Well, Possibly in many ways. So, in a web page, there are many uh, elements that uh, might be protected by law, not only copyright, but also other uh, parts of law. So, for example, there might be text, images, sounds, news items, <coughs> there might be personal data, and you know that these are protected under the data protection law. There can be information or data organized in a systematic way, what is normally called a database, and again, databases are protected by both copyright and uh, uh, a specific sui generis right. Or, there can be content that is, that is not protected by any uh, of this law, but is protected by contract. So the website might place a contract and say, if uh, uh, in order to access uh, this website and to avail of my services, you have to accept my terms and conditions. Terms and conditions is a contract, a legally binding contract. And then there are access control measures, technical measures. For instance, if you want to access the, um, certain uh, parts of a, of a website, for instance, the newspaper, you have to pay a subscription and there is a, what is called a paywall. Uh, what this has to do with law? Well, because the law says that if you circumvent this paywall, you breach the law. You not only breach technology, but also the law. So it is a, a legal offense. These are all examples of uh, direct infringement. But then there is also, and this is very important on the internet, indirect infringement. So this is when um, someone facilitates the um, one of the infringing activity. Typically, a software or a platform that makes uh, available facilities to share files or to do or to engage in other uh, infringing activities. This is a, a secondary liability. Only one, one thing of this difference between direct and indirect or secondary liability because this is important for the case I want to discuss in a bit. And this is that both are infringement, but 
there is an important difference that direct liability does not require knowledge that you are committing an infringement. This is something that is a bit uh, counterintuitive and difficult to, to understand. And uh, to, to be honest, this uh, in many cases does not make sense. But let's suppose that you own a blog and you want to uh, put a picture on the, on the blog and you find this, this picture on the internet, which is very common, so you just go to search with the Google image and you see a picture that you like and you copy and you, you put it in your, in your, in your, in your blog page. Well, this is most likely to be a copyright infringement because uh, unless the, this copying is authorized, this is a direct infringement. And you cannot invoke uh, uh, ignorance as a defense. The fact that I, I, I found this on the internet, I, I thought it was in a good faith presumption that this was uh, authorized. Uh, no, because uh, copyright infringement is, uh, in uh, legal terminology, a tort of strict liability. You infringe, you are liable. End of the story. There are no excuses. This does not apply to secondary infringement. Secondary infringement is, uh, occurs only if you have knowledge or good reason to know that uh, the third party <coughs> who was using your, your platform, for example, was uh, uh, so that is a knowledge requirement. Uh, let's keep in mind this difference because it uh, is uh, important for what we will discuss uh, in, uh, in a bit. Internet intermediaries also benefit from a safe, a so-called safe harbor provision. Why? Think for instance of, of YouTube. On YouTube, I don't remember exactly the figures, but uh, it's something like uh, that every minute uh, 20 or something hours of uh, videos are uploaded. Among these 20, among this mass of videos, there is obviously infringing content. Uh, should YouTube be liable for, for this infringement, this business model would simply not be bearable. They, 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 they would not be um, feasible. So, the law design, yes. Okay, so then why is the Yes, because uh, mega upload was not uh, covered by the by the safe harbor provision, because the safe harbor provision uh, gives uh, exemption immunity from liability, but on a certain condition. To put it simple, on the condition that you are a good guy. I mean, being a good guy means that when you receive notice of infringement, you remove immediately the content. This is the the. the
uh, is different because they do not comply with the, with the requirements of the, of the, of the safe harbor. And so I think and it is on this ground that they are found liable for secondary infringement. Well, So, um, the thing is that uh, uh, copyright is infringed by both humans and machines. So, it is uh, irrelevant whether it is uh, a human that uh, uh, engages into hopping or a machine that automatically crawls the web and makes copies of the, of the content that they found machine in a, a computer or a, or, a, or, a, or a software. This is quite different than with respect to what we've seen in the Pianola case and in the early uh, software uh, cases. Um, however, in the US, most of the technology dictated copying like for instance the copying that is made by search engines is either a fair use, fair use is a doctrine, is a doctrine that uh, uh, exempts certain acts under certain conditions from, from, from infringement and the safe harbor provision. So these both elements make uh, activities like uh, the one of Google or the one of uh, uh, making uh, thumbnails of, uh, of uh, pictures uh, legal. In Europe, the situation is slightly different because there is a sort of safe harbor provision in, uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, internet service providers in the e-commerce directive, but there is not a um, defense, a passport to defense such as a fair use. So courts in Europe have to be, uh, have to invent some uh, uh, criteria to exempt this uh, technology dictated copying from, from infringement. So, for example, in Germany they have used the, doc the, the doctrine of implied license. Implied license works pretty much like this. When you publish something on the internet, you give to search engines an implied license to copy your content for, for indexing. Why we can presume that it is an implied license? Well, because as we see that there are technical means to exclude uh, search engines. If you do not want your your website to be indexed by Google, you can give instructions to Google not to index. But if you do not put these uh, instructions in your, uh, in your website, then we can safely assume that you accept that Google means copy. Uh, this is because there were cases, believe it or not, cases of the owners of websites that sued Google for copying their website. Which under copyright law, this is the, a paradox of copyright law, you copy, you infringe, as we said before. 
And uh, he, the argument is, I have a website. The website is an original uh, work, so it's copyright protected. You, Google, copy my, my website, you infringe. Well, the court said, OK, there is an implied license, at least. Or, as uh, another uh, interesting decision of the Spanish Supreme Court, there is, this is a Roman law principle, there is usus nocus, uh, a use that is uh, not damaging. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old principle of Roman law. That when you, it, that's an interesting principle. That when, when you have a property, and someone uses your property, but that does not cause any damage whatsoever to you, then this use might be permitted. Interesting, because it is, uh, normally we think of property as something that uh, anyone who is trespassing is, is liable. No, there are cases where uh, trespass of property, it is not causing damage, it is, uh, is innocuous, so it's not a uh, reason. And the same principle applied to search engines. What is the damage that is uh, causing uh, this copy? Nothing. Quite on the contrary, it is, it, 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 is, uh, um, it is better for you to be copied because you, you have indexed in Google and in your website appears in search results. So there is a benefit in this, uh, in this copy. So this was just a uh, um, Again, examples on how copyright law had to adapt to accommodate this uh, uh, technology that uses copying for a technological purpose, not for an expressive purpose, not for exploiting the, the content. And uh, what I mentioned before is uh, the, uh, the uh, consent. Internet is, uh, uh, we have to say, was because this, uh, uh, as we've seen a bit, is going to be challenged, was based on a consent architecture. Consent means that I consent others to copy my content unless I clearly express this and how with robots. Robots is a um, um, an instruction not to copy uh, this content. So, um, and what is interesting is that this is not a legal, uh, legally binding, but this is just, uh, so to speak, uh, etiquette on the on the of the internet. So there is no liability for for a search engine, for instance, that does not respect this uh, instruction and copies, notwithstanding there is uh, an instruction not to copy, not to index uh, this content. <coughs> and this has worked well on the on the internet because if we have uh, uh, search engines, if we have an internet uh, which is uh, more or less uh, a space where uh, again, we are more or less able to find what we want to find, this is due to this consent architecture. So if copyright law was to be to applied strictly and literally, uh, we would not have the internet at all. Or at least we would have the internet, but we, we could not find anything. We could not locate resources. So the internet was, would be uh, much, much less powerful than it is uh, now. now, what I want to say is that this consent architecture, this, this, this architecture that has uh, uh, allowed internet to grow so dramatically, so uh, exponentially in the, in the last uh, 20 years, I think, uh, now is uh, in danger. So, uh, the law, copyright law in particular, uh, is uh, uh, changing this uh, uh, architecture. And this change is not a, a deliberate change, but it is a side effect of, uh, of copyright enforcement, as we, uh, we will see. And, uh, So, 
So, case one, hyperlinking. What is hyperlinking? Hyperlinking is uh, the bread and butter of the, of the internet. So, internet can be described as a huge hypertext. A hypertext is a text where each page is connected to, to, to the other by a hyperlinking. So, But what about this? Is when we speak about the hyperlink, and we think how hyperlinking might be an issue, legally speaking. Well, I don't know if you are on this website. For me, that I'm living in England and I want to watch the football matches, and uh, because of geo-blocking, I cannot uh, watch Juventus on the on TV. I have to rely on. Uh, on a website like this, these websites are essentially collections of hyperlinks. Hyperlinks to what? Well, hyperlinks to other websites that uh, place streaming of uh, football matches. Normally, these football matches are restricted because I'm, I'm on pay TV. Okay, we, we, would, we could open a Pandora box here because. Uh, Interestingly, there is, a, to my knowledge, at least one court in the world, in Israel, that say that uh, streaming football matches is fair use because a football match is a cultural an event and there is an interest in the public in uh, watching a football match. So, uh, the, the, the people who upload the streaming of, of, of uh, uh, football matches this should, people should be rewarded, not... not uh, uh, can we cut this from the... <laughs> now, uh, at least in the UK, this is what, uh, what, uh, what appears when you, when, you, when you try to connect to, to Royal Director because the website has been blocked. Blocking injunctions are very popular and very effective in the... In the <coughs> the UK. I don't know if that... Okay, in Italy, I, I tried and, and this is uh, accessible from Italy, so... Uh, this means that blocking injunctions are not so effective in Italy as they are in England. Now, you might think, well, okay, obviously this is the reason why hyperlinks are... Uh, is, has uh, become a legal issue from copyright perspective. So, because obviously there, there are uh, copyright owners that uh, sue uh, these uh, intermediaries like a director for uh, uh, copyright infringement. No, it's not the case. Most of the cases on hyperlinking are on another uh, technology, which is uh, media monitoring. Media monitoring are services that uh, uh, collect. Um, information are essentially search engines specialized in uh, news items. Google News is another famous example. And uh, they produce press reports upon payment, <coughs> these are all the payment, uh, they all charge a fee for this service. And uh, they um, give you a list of hyperlinks to uh, newspapers that publishes certain news. <coughs> you, you enter the keyword and uh, this is how it goes. Now, there are a number of cases on the, uh, that have been brought before court because uh, the, the publishers think that they are entitled to um, an exclusive use of uh, these hyperlinks. So you know that normally newspapers have uh, content which is free, freely available online, and the content that is uh, under the paywall, you have to pay for to access. Uh, these news monitoring services, most of, 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 the, of these services that, that has been sued before courts, they link only to content that is freely available online. So the argument is, what have I done wrong? This content was already online, I just 
collect, I gather this information and I provide this service to, to my customers. The publishers say, well, this is, a, again, you are communicating my work to the public. Communication to the public is a, an infringement. So you have to pay a license if you want to, uh, to link to, to my content. So this is an example of uh, how many infringements could possibly be in a, in, a, in a news monitoring service. This is Google News. If you type Polytechnic Reporting in the news, you have a hyperlink, you have a snippet, so it is a short sentence, an extract from the, from the news item. Uh, thumbnail is the same uh, as a hyperlink, but it's a picture, so you click a picture and you put the and of course, there is an underlying reproduction of the whole content. So, again, this is possibly a, a copy of the infringement. So, the point is is this a mere technological copying, technology dictated copying that uh, should be excused under fair use, under the other documents that we've seen? or is an exploitative copying, a way of copying that uh, actually enables exploiting the content by infringing. We see that in this case we have something uh, borderline. The publishers say that this is clear infringement and we want to be paid for, for, for this. We want Google to pay us for uh, collecting our information displaying snippets and the hyperlinks. So, briefly, let's briefly move to the uh, uh, Spenson case. Spenson is a case of the European Court of Justice that has been decided last year on exactly this, this issue, whether hyperlinking to content that is free available online is an infringement or not. So, before Svensson, European courts have addressed this many times and they say general is not a direct infringement. Why? Because there is no communication of the world to the public. I mean, a hyperlink is pretty much like uh, uh, I meet someone on the street uh, asking me where is the, the bookstore and they say the bookstore is there. So I'm pointing the person to the bookstore. I am not liable if the bookstore is selling uh, infringing copies. Uh, hyperlink is pretty much the same, it's just pointing to a, in a certain direction. If there, there is something infringing, this is not my, my fault. So, no direct infringement, possibly indirect infringement. A royal director knows that all the links are direct into infringing content. So, since previously we discussed that uh, the secondary infringement requires knowledge, in that case, a court might say, well, yeah, there, there is knowledge because this content is obviously infringing. So you know that um, you are linking to infringing content. But again, this is secondary liability. Spencer said that, as usually, as frequently, the, the ECJ took uh, a sort of uh, in-between. They say, yes, hyperlinking is a communication, but it's not communication to the public, unless certain criteria are met. It is a communication to the public if the original communication is subject to access protection mechanism. So if you link to a content which is protected by a paywall, if you link to, um, for example, to um, a newspaper article for which you have to pay to, to, to access, then this is a public communication. 
the communication must reach a new public, so a public that the original copyright owner was not taking into account when making this the first communication. So, if uh, the content was freely available online, this means that it was addressed to the whole public of the world. So, linking to this particular content is not an infringement because uh, the, the content was uh, addressed to the world in the first place. But, if the content was addressed, for instance, only to uh, people of a particular area, this typically with uh, geo-blocking or with uh, technical measures, then you reach a new public and a new infringement. And there is also an impact on the market of the, of the original world. Now, <clears throat> what is the consequence of this, uh, of this decision? Well, this decision has been presented in, uh, in the, on the press as a sort of a victory of the internet. They say, oh, internet is safe because the, the, court, the European Court uh, finally said that uh, linking to content that is publicly available is not an infringement, so uh, yes, okay, this is uh, in part true and the, in fact uh, the, uh, a ruling that uh, would say that uh, hyperlinking is public communication so as an infringement would be a disaster for the internet. Nevertheless, uh, the criteria said that the European Court is quite complicated to understand. Did you understand what, what, when uh, an, in, an hyperlink is infringing or not? When there is a new public? When the, um, imagine uh, uh, many, many old people who are uh, using the internet to write blogs, uh, to post uh, news uh, on Facebook. Uh, uh, so hyperlinking is again, as I said, the bread and butter of, uh, of the internet communication. Uh, under this decision, you, you need to make sure that you have a hyperlinking to not only to legal content, to content that has been made available with the consent of the right holder. And it is not always easy to determine. In some cases it is obvious that it is illegal, but in other cases, not at all obvious. And also you have to take into account the, this new public uh, requirement. So this creates a lot of uncertainty. And what is the, 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 the effect of this? Well, the effect of this is that people might uh, start copying instead of linking, which is exactly the opposite effect. That, uh, the right holder wanted to achieve. So in a way, if you think hyperlinking is a way to avoid copying, you want to point to someone <coughs> to a certain resource, but you don't want to copy that resource, you hyperlink. Because uh, everybody knows more or less that copying uh, can be an infringement. But what if uh, hyperlink is an infringement? Then uh, if it is the same copying or hyperlinking, then copying will become more popular. So uh, this uh, might have this uh, strange effect on, on the on the internet practice. Now there is a new uh, referral to the European Court, which uh, will uh, address precisely this issue: whether link into an infringing content is direct infringement or not. Uh, I think uh, uh, we can stop here and take some, some questions perhaps before... Uh, looking at the very last question and maybe conclude, yes? Okay. Well, you mentioned also the case of geo-blocking. Sorry, Ben? Geo-blocking. Geo-blocking. Ah, Geoblock, yeah. yeah. I think some for example. Let's say I have a Netflix account. Let's say I use a VPN. So I'm using the blog. In my opinion, you are not infringed, but this is just my opinion. I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't think that this is an infringement. Uh, at least it is not an infringement to. Uh, uh, 
to circumvent geo-blocking within the European Union because there is a, in the European Union there is a principle of uh, uh, freedom of movement of services and goods that has been affirmed also in copyright cases in, uh, in a case called the Football Association Premier League but this is a case that has been also presented in the media is the case of the, the lady in, in the UK who won a pub and uh, was buying uh, decoders from Greece to display the football matches of, uh, of the football uh, of, of the Premier League in her pub in the UK. Why? Because uh, the decoders in, in Greece were cheaper than, uh, than in, uh, in, uh, in the UK because the license for Premier League matches is cheaper in another country. So uh, the Football Association of Premier League sued for copyright infringement, but the court famously said no, this is not an infringement because uh, in the European Union the principle of free movement of service prevails, so there is no infringement. Uh, with the US, there might be the case of circumvention of, uh, of technical measures. So this uh, could possibly be uh, infringement. I don't know if. Uh, I, I, I do. I actually had a, a, another question, but I, I left the first round. Do you agree that circumventing uh, job blocking within the European Union is, uh, should be legal? At least, if uh, we got sued and we go to the ECJ, the Court of Justice should uh, say you're right. I, I guess so. I, I hope so. <laughs> Geo blocking is particularly a nasty thing, and in fact, uh, the European Commission is addressing this and saying that uh, within, at least within the European market, geo blocking should not be allowed. So the content should be accessible from everywhere in the European Union. Yeah, actually, I have a question about the. the requirements of the Svensson case. So it, it looks to me that uh, uh, the, the court is somehow shifting some of the responsibility of a broken uh, technological measure of protection to the people linking. Because uh, 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 how can uh, uh, something be inaccessible to the general public of the internet if it's accessible through a, a link? I, I mean, if uh, my link goes through uh, in our server is essentially equivalent to uh, a publicly accessible VPN which, which, which just uh, routes to my users uh, a content which is just available to me because uh, I, I located my server in a specific place and so on. I, I can see how this is uh, happening but this is not really linking. This is a circumvention, an active circumvention. If I'm just linking to something uh, which is protected by a paywall, but by a broken paywall which lets people copy and paste links. So, I mean, in my opinion, the technological measure protection is, is broken, and it, it, the responsibility of fixing that should be on the right holder. But I don't know if you have yeah, other so examples so I, to I, I, This is uh, something that is not addressed in the, in the decision, and in fact, this is left to speculation. What does it mean to link uh, to a protected content, I don't know, because uh, if you link to a protected content, but then you have to pay to, pay to enter your password, then what's the problem? If you link to a broken, uh, if you provide a password, this is a okay. conventional technological measure, it's not a... a okay, should be, it could happen that within the link, you also copy and paste, the, I mean, an API code, the password, something like that. This is a potential case, but, but this is a convention, it's not just a link. I mean. In case the, the, the mean to access the content is the REST API and, and the password would be included in the link, okay, the, the, the two things collide, but it's just a, a special case. I mean. Yes, no, exactly. That's why it, it, it would make much, much more sense to, uh, to say that hyperlinking is possibly uh, indirect infringement. This I can, I, I can accept that uh, a royal director is indirect infringement. Uh, they link to protect the content knowing that the content is infringing. So uh, this is a typical classical case of, of the secondary infringement. Um, I 
other people do not have the arsenic and the download and leave the same for me from other years. Most likely these are the these are small infringements that are the, that have not so reached the threshold of a, of alarm for a, for publishers to sue. So there are certain categories of I told that are more active in uh, in uh, suing. At the moment, uh, news uh, newspaper publishers are very active. Uh, scientific publishers are active against libraries. There are a uh, number of lawsuits. There are disputes about uh, e lending and these, these, these things. So this is that they are named from. Uh, I have no knowledge, but I might be wrong, of uh, lawsuits against this uh, academia.edu, these uh, websites where you, you, you easily share, uh, you, you can share scientific papers and things like that. But copyright uh, is pretty much shaped by the attitudes of our folders. Uh, about the, the newspaper publisher, I, I just wanted to, uh, to, to ask you a comment about uh, uh, the, the, the peculiar situation in which, uh, uh, on, on the one hand, uh, they, they, they do want to be compensated for snippets and so on. On the other hand, they do not want to use the robot.txt approach in the sense that they do not want to be just dark. So uh, they want the best of both worlds. So I, I, how is this compatible with uh, a sensible approach to copyright law? Or that, that, does it require uh, bringing into the, uh, the picture also competition law? Let's say it's reasonable to argue that uh, Google should index you and also pay you because Google is, is in a dominant position, or it's just a general principle because of which uh, you you may require that you are both uh, visible and compensated, and not just uh, asked to choose between one of the two situations. Yes, yes, I mean, it's a complicated issue. The, the, the thing is that uh, this is uh, the, the the news uh, extension and the Google News case are all examples of how. Uh, this is a very important uh, regulatory issue that when it is addressed by copyright uh, you see that copyright is not the right instrument to, to address this because with copyright you, are, you have only opposing private interests that, uh, that, that conflict and one of the interests prevail and this determines the, the way internet works like in the case of, uh, of hyperlinks but with, uh, with uh, Google uh, News in particular, there is a, an issue that is, that is raised by, not only by publishers, but by all content producers, content providers. They say uh, Google is making uh, a huge service to the humanity, but at the same time is making business and does not produce any content. As I was saying in the, in the beginning, they appoint a lot of corporate lawyers, but they do not produce any content. So there is at least a sort of a duty to, to contribute to culture, to contribute to content uh, production. So in this respect, in the, in, the, in the framework of a global regulatory framework of the, of the new information market, that might make sense to, to have a tax on, uh, on uh, uh, search engines and search services that uh, um, that do not produce content, but they, 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 uh, they make their business with, uh, with this. So there might be a case. Uh, but again, uh, the, 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 this, to address this issue with copyright is not the right way, because uh, you, you have to expand copyright in, a, in, a, in an unreasonable way. You do not, in other words, you do not need to, to say that hyperlinking is an infringement to, to have Google paying some money to sustain the, the, the sector of the information. And this, you, you can do this with a tax. With a, with a, you know. There are other ways of redistributing resources. Copyright is not uh, the right instrument to redistribute resources in the information market. Uh, as to the, the, 
There is, of course, this thing that, okay, news publishers, they do not insert robots because they want to be indexed, but at the same time, they want to be compensated. Well, if you listen to their argument, they say, yes, but we have no choice. Because uh, if we are not indexed by Google, we simply uh, lose our clientele and we, we say goodbye to the market. So, uh, but at the same time, with, uh, with this system, we cannot sustain ourselves because uh, uh, their argument is that services like Google News are substituted to, to, to the news. They are not just uh, indexing services, they are not just search services, but they are information services because uh, they say you, you, now you read the Google News page, you do not read the newspapers anymore. So it's more about the snippets than about the high uh, So that's why, for example, in, in, in Spain they have uh, now introduced. Uh, uh, system of compensation for these uh, units. By the way, the the, the Svensson uh, decision the, in, in, in the Svensson decision, the court said that um, this is the right way to interpret the right of the public communication right in the European Union and to give broad interpretation, so member states are not allowed to give broader interpretation so as to include, for example, hyperlinks within the restricted facts. So this is not permitted under, because this would create uh, divergences in the internal market. If a hyperlinking is permitted in one country and not in another, it uh, creates a mess for the internal market. So for this reason, it is not do you have any other questions? Okay, in that case, thank you for your attention.